I'm so excited today to have with us Glenn Morshower. Glenn is a well-known actor. He's a speaker. He's also got an acting studio. Uh, Glenn has been in over 250 films and television projects in his career spanning six decades. Mm. I know. Mm. You must have started when you were two, Glenn. It's a little jolt. <laughs> <laughs> He's well known for playing Agent Aaron Pierce in the television series 24, as well as reoccurring roles in CSI, The West Wing, Dallas, Friday Night Lights, and a long list of television credits. On the big screen, Glenn has appeared in Transformers, Moneyball, X-Men, All the King's Men, Black Hawk Down, Pearl Harbor, Air Force One, Star Trek, and too many others to name. Currently, Glenn is in season four of the TV series, The Resident. I know there's a lot of big fans out there. He also is going to be in the upcoming fourth season of Ozark. I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah, it's exciting. Glenn, yes, Glenn is a has an acting school where he trains and mentors aspiring actors. I've heard such tremendous feedback from your students when I've been part of your clubhouse calls. In 2017, Glenn did a TEDx talk called Whispers and Boomerangs. Whispers is a reoccurring theme. Glenn's a professional speaker sharing life and business lessons and speaks on many transformational topics. Someone described what Glenn shares as mind-bending thoughts on life, the universe, and everything. And I agree with that. Glenn has shared at my inner circle and it's been a true inspiration to me and the group. I'm excited and honored to have you today, Glenn. Welcome, my friend. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for having me. Honored to be here. Always grateful to uh, share from my heart. And frankly, this is my favorite thing to do in my entire life. That is not just a uh, you know, convenient thing to say or fashionable thing to say. It's actually the truth. And, and I want to give you the why. The why is because as an actor, our job is to bring life to somebody else's words. Wow. Well said. That's the big difference. And so when I'm on stage, these are my words. These are my feelings. This is a chance to share who it is I am, not who a director wants me to be or who a writer wants me to be or even who an audience wants me to be. So this is the raw version of me. I've been doing it a very long time, 36 years, been making my living as an actor for 46 years. But, um, but speaking is, is just very dear to me. So I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I love that distinction you just made about why you enjoy speaking and sharing and impacting people's lives. And I've watched you on your days off, get up early to be on podcast and to be on Clubhouse and to be on Facebook Lives. In fact, I met you through our friend Ken Walls, who's mm -hmm. at Academy Glenn. And of course, I'd heard so much about you from our mutual friends, Mike Muni, the founder of Act Software and Jim Gardner and Jim many Bo. others. So it was such an honor to meet you and meet you in person as well. And uh, again, and thanks for buying lunch. <laughs> I, we might have gone to Pan, Pandora. I don't remember where we went. I think we went, we went to uh, Corner Bakery. Yes. Uh, no, that was that was great to meet you in person. And yeah, so just watching you, Glenn, in the in on TV on the big screen, and it seems like you just had such an eclectic big career. But then watching you in my world of the speaking world and personal development, share again, just with your own unique message. You're not copying anyone else's message. I love mm -hmm. that. I know that it comes from a inspirational place and I hope we can tap into that today, but let's begin a little bit on the acting side. So you grew up in Dallas. I did. And what, when was it that you decided you were going to be an actor? When I was uh, 11 years old, my mom took me to uh, see a play at the Dallas theater center called, well, it was, it's a very well-known play, Charles Dickens play, a Christmas Carol. And she simply wanted to give us some um, exposure to the arts. Right. I believe, I believe the word my mother chose was culture. I'm going to get you boys some culture. So she, uh, she took my brother, Brian and, um, and me to the theater and Brian would rather have been eating broken glass and mayonnaise. That's how little appeal it had to him. And for me, it's life-changing. Hence the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I would take it a step further and say everything 
is in the eye of the beholder, everything. So it is so interesting that a meaningless day in his life, and it was meaningless, was perhaps the most meaningful day for me while experiencing the exact same stimulus. There's a lot to be gleaned from that. You know? Was that serendipitous for her to take you or was she into the theater and into arts? No, she really wasn't. She just thought, you know, this seems like this would be good for the boys. Wow. You know, go see some, some theater. And we did. And what she didn't know and what I didn't know when the curtain came up is that a few minutes later, someone I knew personally was going to walk out onto the stage, a friend of mine from school. I didn't know she was in a play. I didn't bother to look at the program. I'm simply watching the play unfold. And my friend Debbie Siegel walks out. It's kind of funny, the idea of a Jewish girl that's in the play about Christmas. But uh, Debbie Siegel was in the play. And at the intermission, I was so enthralled with the experience. They, they really seemed like they were in this beautiful fantasy world. And boy, I remember it like it was this morning. How excited I was to observe their enthusiasm and even the word enthusiasm which you know is a derivative of the word theos and theos which is of god and a lot of people don't know that about the word enthusiasm but whenever we see someone channeling enthusiasm it literally means that they are radiating the light of god and that's what uh, my reaction was to it so at intermission i'm tugging on my mother's shirt and saying you know uh what could i do to be a part of this, because if Debbie can do it, then I, I don't see any reason. I don't think they barred redheaded boys from being a part of theater. And she enrolled me. So I was lucky that I had a very uh, lucky, fortunate that I had a parent who was extremely supportive and who went into action. You know, there's a thing that I learned from, um, I'm sure you know, Scott McCain, mm -hmm. uh, but Scott McCain taught me this. And it's such a beautiful statement. We all know about ROI. And um, he talks about a condition known as COI, which is the cost of inaction. Ooh, that's brilliant. Mm. The cost of inaction, which can be very severe. Well, had my mother not acted on my desires that I expressed to her in the moment, like it wasn't a week later, it was right there at intermission before we even go back in. I want to do this. I want to do this. And my mother took action. And because she did get this, she not only changed my life, she changed my children's lives because my children were born and raised in California because that is the trajectory my life took courtesy of my mother's willingness to support my desire. Wow. It is so it is generational. It's so far reaching that one moment misplayed or one moment well played and forgive me, but I may get teary eyed, which is the elation of feeling so much. I can say honestly that at 62 and change, I turned 62 in April, April 24th. And here I am a little over a month later, I am bar none, the happiest I have ever been in my entire life. And I have been happy my whole life. There were some difficult things to deal with as a child, but my adult life has been remarkably satisfying. I married an incredible woman and we are here together for 42 years married. We've been together for 44. Uh, I'm blessed from above that I was able to be a dad to a daughter and a son. So both of those dimensions have been experienced. Uh, the one aspect of life that I have not yet experienced and you know, Kyle, there's so much to be said, but I am someone who trusts. I believe in God profoundly and not the version that somebody else taught me, mm -hmm. but rather the version that my own heart wanted me to understand. And in that belief, what I believe is that the intended earth school curriculum is exactly what I'm being exposed to, just as it was intended by God, which means the one title that I've never had is grandpa, because neither one of our kids have children. And what I want to say to you is that whether I ever, ever become a grandpa or not, I am so fine with either scenario. Either one is fine. And that's because of this deep and abiding trust that I have that life shows up and works out as it is intended to. And our only job 
is to do our part. That's our job. And then let everything else go because we all make lousy other people. Let me say that again. All of us make lousy other people, meaning it's not our job to be somebody else. We're going to be lousy at it. Our job is to be great us's. And as long as we're doing that and supporting others in the expansion of themselves so that they too can become great versions of them, then we've done our job. And my relationship, the most important relationship I have, other than my relationship with the very God I believe in, is my relationship with myself on the final day of my life. Mm. And I have been in profound relationship with that version of me for many, many years, allowing him to teach me, show me, guide me, and lead me. And I'm not reading from a script right now. I don't have any notes in front of me. This is just speaking from my heart. How will I feel on that day? Because we all get to that day. And I don't mean how will I feel physically. I mean, how will I feel about it being the end of the road of what it meant to be a human being? Because at that point, when there is no time left, he won't be able to do anything about adjusting the way life looked. Mm. Because he'll be out of time. Which means... He is not his answer. I am his answer. Wow. Therefore, he needs me. He needs me to actively help him write a satisfying script that he can be proud of at the end of his life so that he looks at the entirety of his life in review and says, that is exactly the life I came to live that's it. And I feel wonderful about that. That is the guiding relationship of my life. It's the one that keeps everything driven. It's the one that keeps me in check. It's the one that keeps me from making bad decisions. Or if I make a decision that is in question or it's, in, it's out of integrity or it's incongruent with my highest available nature, then bam, I get an instant warning. There's a dashboard light that comes up in my life that says, not for you, kid. Not for you. No matter what the rest of the world believes, this is not part of your intended earth school curriculum. It keeps me wide awake. It keeps me passionate. It keeps me driven. And most of all, Kyle, it keeps me at a level of aliveness that is just beautiful to be wide awake, conscious, and alive, fully alive, where you're not thinking in terms of it'll get better when. No, it's not going to get better when. It's already better. Time to notice that. It's not going to get better when I get a different car, a different house, a different wife, a different anything. It's better right now. And my whole life has been devoted to that. So that's what I'm here feeling. I am an admitted contrarian and not the kind that's a pain in the ass, but a contrarian that is only contrary to systems that we have set up as the way it is in society. And we are allowing these agreed upon scenarios, laws, if you will, unspoken laws that are guiding our every move. And some of them need to be challenged and I'm going to give you an example of that today, but they need to be examined and challenged by someone who is of greater faith in humankind than the people who wrote those laws. But Keep then we're all having our unique experiences too, right? That's part of it. Absolutely. So Glenn, you said so much. And so it's yeah. like, I, sorry, the, I'm kind of no, like drinking no. out of a fire hose. No, it's amazing. And I don't want to stop you. I want to unpack a little bit of it. Sure. I'm, I'm going to pick up where we, where you left off about being in touch with your dying day. Your death day self. Yes. So with that, is that something you examine daily? Is that something you have to be intentional about? Or is that omnipresent? Is that something in your mind? Is that something you write in a journal? No, How do you stay in touch with that? I pretty much think about it every day. It is not a morose thought, by the way. It's yeah. not morose at all. It is simply, you know, like it, it certainly helps pro teams to look up at the clock. Right. That's helpful. Because if there's, if you get a two minute warning, 
you're playing a different ball game, especially if you're down. And if you're ahead, you also play a different ball game because the clock is in your favor and you're working on that. So being aware that, that, you know, there is a time limit to at least the, the earthly experience of life, the human body and so forth is to me, very motivating. Like is I said, on, is the, that on paper? Is that just present in your mind? Just in my, just in my mind of always, always wanting to befriend every version of myself, including the ones I've not yet become. It's uh, it, and it's something that uh, that teaching has helped a tremendous amount of people with intentionality. And I, I do want to give you one example, Kyle, of what I'm talking about, because it really is worth peeling back. And that is, and I'm, and I'm pretty daring fella because I'm even willing to put up for review something as widely accepted as the serenity prayer. And this is going to do a lot of people some good if they can uncross their arms and hear what I'm about to say. So the serenity prayer, which is beautiful, by the way, I want to go on record saying I'm a fan. However, there is one word that in my view needs to be adjusted and it makes it a stronger prayer. So I want to run this by you. Okay. The prayer is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Here's my rewrite. The whole prayer changes with the addition of one letter. And that letter is the letter S. And now the prayer sounds this way. God grants me the serenity, hmm. not God grant me. Wow. God grants me, meaning that is what is a daily occurrence. It's God grants me that serenity. The reason we don't need to say God grant me, and I have spoken this at churches, Kyle, and, and it, it does have people scratching their head going, how long could this have been gone on? And nobody pointed out something. So when we say, God grant me the serenity, the first thing this presupposes is that that has not already occurred. Mm. That's the first thing it assumes. Otherwise, if it had occurred and you believe it had occurred, why would you be asking for it? God grant me the serenity. It means I ain't got it. So I'm asking you to grant it to me. So let's say you're at a 12-step meeting and you say, God grant me the serenity. Well, a week later at your meeting, you're saying it again. So do you think God didn't pay attention to your prayer? Or do you believe in a God who only gives out small dosages of serenity? Hmm. I'm a sensible man, and it does not make sense to me to ask for something and then ask for it again and then ask for it again, and then ask for it again. Because that means you actually don't believe you ever received it in the first place, or you believe in a stingy God. And so, Glenn, was that something you were taught, or you discovered that you don't have to keep asking? Is that part of the contrarianness that you mentioned? I was you challenge a little bit of what the teaching is to just have that self-discovery of... Yeah, it was a matter of listening to the whisper. This is where the TEDx talk came. That whisper gently told me the serenity prayer could be improved. It could be improved. It's a really good prayer. It could be better. There are a lot of people praying it. It could be better. Just so you know, let them know that I gave them serenity at birth. Let them know that. Love that. Love that. I gave them serenity at birth and they've been asking me for it ever since. And frankly, it's becoming a bit of a pain in the butt because you're asking me for what I already gave you. And that applies across the board. I would do think you that. think. Yeah. Yes. So, God protect me, protect my family, protect this house. Yeah. Give like, me, like that wasn't the plan. Yes. Give me like guidance. you had redirected God's plan because he was planning, planning on injuring you. So here's a question. Do you feel like, and I'm generalizing more times than not, you have to let go of a belief to receive new influence or new insight. Come on with it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Emphatically. Not Emphatically. being attached to how we think it is. Yeah. Or, or quit living life by rote. Mm -hmm. Quit doing that. If you believe in God, for God's sakes, believe in an enormous God. Yes. I'm not trying to tell people to believe in God. What I'm saying is attention, time out. Hello. 
Attention, believers. If you believe in God, quit believing in a weenie version of God. Go ahead and believe in the enormity of God, which would include you having an open dialogue where you could receive instructions as to what is and is not intended for your life. You don't have to live life by rote just because our forefathers, I mean, we didn't, you think about it. We didn't stop with the radio just because we thought the radio was a good idea. We went on to invent television and we didn't stop there. We went on to invent the VCR and the DVD and VHS, Betamax, VHS. So we're always building on something that was state of the art at the time. And I believe that even belief systems can be generationally state of the art Hmm. until somebody comes along or a change, i.e. COVID comes along and puts everybody in timeout and knocks on the door of resourcefulness and says, might be time for you to reflect. What are you going to do with this time? Or are you just going to feel wounded and inconvenienced because your ass got knocked out of business? Or are you going to put on your entrepreneurial cap and, and, and think, okay, it's time to redirect. You think I ever thought I would teach acting online? Never. And COVID said, yes, you will. You know, Tom Ziegler said the quicker, and this was right when COVID kicked off. He said the quicker people can let go of how they think it should be or how it was uh, and embrace where it's going. And that happens to me all the time. People will say, hey, Kyle, why don't we do the inner circle or do this or do that the way we used to and versus, you know, that, that was then we, you know, where are we marching to now based on what's going on in the world and circumstances and myself and the members and things like that. So you, uh, you pivoted pretty quick. You, you know, you touched on you, you, it was a couple of words, your family moved to California and you said you've had an amazing life other than some childhood difficulties. And my question is, do you feel like some of those challenges have helped make you who you are today, that it caused you to question things, to take a pivot going one direction or another? And I want to also include that with, you mentioned you're a contrarian by nature. How much do challenges help redirect you to find the truth or to find new discre- or to find new discoveries? Yeah, all, all the time is the answer. And, and the truth is, uh, yes, to how much do I believe it impacted me? Um, what what role did it play in my life? Everything wasn't easy, but I'm also not complaining because that which was not easy also honed, shaped, and refined my very beingness, everything about it. You know, there are only two kinds of people that we meet in life. I don't mean that there are, aren't many kinds. You could say there are 123 kinds or there are five kinds or whatever, but the two categories that certainly everyone falls into is that you meet people whose behavior is worthy of replication, meaning you admire them. You look up to them, you learn from them and you say, I want to add that to my life. That's beautiful. I, I, I love watching how you live your life. And then there's the other camp that models behavior for you that you find to be unattractive. And if you've been on the receiving end of it, perhaps even painful, that it affected you adversarially. And you make a mental note, don't do that. Mm -hmm. So life is made up of do, do that. Don't do that. Does it get any easier than that? That's about as easy a game plan as there is, is replicate the behavior you admire and discard the, the behavior that you don't admire. And sometimes and, that's the same person. Sometimes of course it a director can. or a president or whoever it may be, you say, this is good. This is not good. We, right. we don't have to make someone all good, all right, or all wrong. And I'm sure you've learned that on a movie set. Uh, I call it the hair in the pizza. That might sound kind of disgusting, but you know, someone they're starving. They can't wait to get that pizza. Here it comes. It looks so amazing. (laughs) And then they see this little tiny hair. And of course it messes up the whole pizza. And I get that, but uh, the ability (laughs) to say, I'm going to disregard. It's really beautiful. and Yeah. yeah, Sorry. Uh, (laughs) I don't use it often for the obvious reasons now that uh, we discovered, but let's just use a pizza in general. I, 
you know, let's say 90% of the pizza is amazing in one slice. And that one slice isn't going to change. But what happens is, is the relationship gets bigger, that one slice gets bigger, but proportionally, it's still 10%. And so sure. I would think in your profession, you're confronted with things that, you know, whether it's people or, I mean, you, you're you dealing with just, I'm sure, egos at times and people that are very power driven and trying to distinguish between the good and what's not so good. That's a bit of a dance, I would think. It is. And I'll tell you, there's a 12-step saying that's very helpful in that regard. And I'm not a member of the 12-step program. I did go to a few years worth of meetings because my brother was an alcoholic, uh, which ultimately and sadly took his life. Um, it took everything before it took his life. And the last thing he had to, to hang on to was his physical life itself because it had eroded everything else. And then finally, on, uh, on March the 12th of 2019, it took that as well. So for a number of years, I went to meetings because my brother would not. And I've never had an issue with drinking, but I wound up going because I wanted to explore the meetings he wouldn't attend to see if maybe I could learn a thing or two because he trusted me, um, entirely trusted me. And that would allow me to possibly download some helpful teachings that he wouldn't otherwise hear. And it was a good strategy and, you know, helpful. And I was able to share some things with him. But one of my favorite things I learned in, uh, in my attendance of the 12-step program is when they, they said, take what works and leave the rest. Mm. I think it's one of the greatest teachings, which is the hair and the pizza. It's what you're talking about. You, you said nobody has to be all good or all bad. And so take the good and leave the rest. You know, it's, Jim Rohn, uh, one of my favorite Jim Rohn quotes is be a student, not a follower. Take advice, but not orders. Make sure everything you do is the product of your own conclusion. And that really set me in that good. Oh, buddy, that, he and I would have been friends. <laughs> yes, for no doubt. That, That's my that, life. Let's just turn this off right now. You just <laughs> described my entire belief system. Thank you, Jim. Yes. Wow. It, which so that meant for me, I could listen to Tony Robbins and then Joel Osteen, and then read Think and Grow Rich, and say, I like this, but just because I don't agree with this, I don't have to ignore all the truth that I do like. Nor do you and, have to begin to dislike the person because something right. moved through them that you disagree with. Right. Why should that one thing negate all of the other? And on the flip side, it also means, you know, I don't have to be a follower per se, I don't have to buy into everything. You don't have to drink the Kool-Aid. You don't. Yeah. So it allows you to not trip up on certain things, but it also allows you not to feel like you have to be like everyone else following. And, and so again, and, and Jim was a contrarian for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, he, now, he definitely I, I want to was a maverick on that, uh, on the idea of being a contrarian, because that can be dicey because I personally how about this? I'm more than a contrarian, I'm someone who's, this is a more accurate description, Kyle. I'm someone who's willing to be a contrarian. Yes. I don't automatically take a contrary position. There are many instances in my life where I, I will listen to someone and go, boy, that's only entirely true. <laughs> that's just beautiful. You know, so a contrarian, especially when it becomes a sickness, can be someone who just automatically takes a stance against everything. And if you say it goes left, they tell you it's right. And if it's up, they say down. And that is not me. No, great distinction. So true. Yeah. So I'm willing to be a contrarian when I believe in my deepest heart of hearts that there's a better way. So if I see someone, let's say, for example, I see someone on the side of the road who's attempting to change a tire with a pair of pliers. Does it make me a contrarian to offer them a lug wrench? I mean, I'm going contrary to what they're doing, but the reason I'm doing it is I understand the difference in efficiency. Hmm. And there they are with bloody knuckles. And it's interesting. There are those beings on the planet that will fight to their death with their bloody knuckles, insisting on doing it their way. And they've yet to budge a lug nut and they've achieved bleeding. So they're already bloody 
the nuts haven't moved and you hand them a lug nut or lug wrench and they say, get out of here. I've known those kinds of people and I'm not here to push. I'm just saying, dude, you can be back on the road here in like eight minutes if, if you just use a lot and you know, but would you say that's probably some sort of childhood trauma of where they just were told they're wrong and it, it's probably, it's probably backlash from that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and by God, I'm going to hold on to doing it my way. I've never wanted to do things my way in life. I've wanted to do it the best way. Hmm. And if we were in business together, I wouldn't care who came up with the winning idea. I would love the fact that we won. Hmm. That, that's kind of where I'm focused. And, and I believe that God takes turns. Uh, I think that you will be the one that comes up with a solution hmm. a large percentage of the time. And other times I will. And the idea is to not get into a, a struggle, an ego struggle over who came up with it. Because at the end of the day, neither one of us came up with it. We were just both channels that it broadcast through. So it's not even our information any more than a radio owns the song that plays on it. Hmm. You know, all of us are radios, all of us are receivers, and we don't own the information that moves through us. So now I'm going to, I'm going to explore an idea here based on what we're talking about. When it comes to actors, you've worked with a who's who of actors. I have. Brad Pitt. I mean, just this whole long list. Do you mind naming a few? I don't want to put you on the spot. Good Lord. I've worked with, I've worked with, oh my God, Andy Griffith, Dick Van Dyke, uh, Meryl Streep, uh, Karen Valentine, which I had a, I had a crush on Karen when I was watching room 222 when we were kids. You remember room 222? Sure. And then I wound up doing a, a movie with Karen, Jill Clayburg, who I love so much and, uh, worked with Jack Lemon. Uh, and recently had the pleasure of working with Denzel Washington, playing his boss in the movie, the little things um, I, I, I've been around Harrison Ford. Good Lord. And it, it goes on and on and on and on. So true. And then directors uh, who's who have directors. I Wolfgang remember. Peterson, right. Who directed us in air force one uh, the great Ridley Scott, the greatest director I've ever worked with. John Kassar, the greatest TV director I've ever worked with, who was our primary guy on 24. Um, Blair Hayes, who does tremendously deep, emotionally connected work. We did a Christmas movie together in Nashville a couple of years ago called Every Other Holiday. But yeah, I've, I've worked with And with Michael all Bay the has actually probably helped with your royalty checks. Michael Bay has been a dear friend. And, uh, you know, when it comes to action adventure, um, I don't know of anyone who's better at directing stuff like that. And I just had the pleasure of working with uh, Robin Wright. A lot mm. of people remember her as Robin Wright Penn. Robin Wright directed uh, the episodes of Ozark that I just finished shooting. For, in, she's uh, from Dallas as well. In Atlanta. Yeah. So. Wow. Powerful. And so again, and there, there's a whole list of names you did not mention that I have in front of me. And so with your desire to share, to speak, to put out in the world, and this incredible list of relationships that you keep having reoccurring roles show up with them, do you have a desire to uh, write a movie or to be the producer or to direct a movie? And if not, what, what's kept you from wanting to go that direction? It's a great question. Uh, I feel it's the inevitable progression, the natural organic progression of things will find me in the director's chair. After all, I keep one here to ready my butt for it. Actually, oh, yeah. That's... Add to you have an acting school as well. So yes, I do. And I do a lot of directing and I've, and I've been directing for many, many years and I've directed short films, but, um, I'll wind up directing a feature. I'm sure it'll probably be sooner than later. Um, it to this point has not been that important to me to do it. I love being an actor. I've also already made films, meaning that my wife and I executive produced a film uh, back in 2012 uh, that was released in 2014, a film called flutter. And, uh, and that was a powerful experience to be the providers along with my buddy, John Hall, who helped us finance the film and uh, so, so part of it, it's 
a big commitment. So you have to really be enticed, I would think. Without question. And when the right movie comes down the pike and they want me to direct it, I'll direct it. I've been offered other directorial assignments for feature films. I've already been offered two movies to direct. And both times I was really up to my neck in business with a series, one during 24 and another one while I've been shooting the residents. So I haven't been free to do it. And being a, a director is a full-time commitment as Jason Bateman can attest yes. that actors, we go in, we do our scenes, we leave. Directors don't, they go in and they stay all day, every day for the entirety of a production. So I've never, I've never known that level of commitment. Even Kiefer Sutherland on 24, my, my buddy Kiefer, even Kiefer, if you think about it, you think, well, God, he must be there all the time. No, he's there most of the time. But there are a lot of uh, days when he doesn't have to work that day and he doesn't come in or he does one or two scenes and then leaves. And the director of those episodes, they're there all day, every day. So it's the highest level of commitment there is, is being a director. I think of uh, Ben Stiller and uh, uh, Ben Affleck and Clooney and some of those that did it a few times. And they're like, that's not something they're ambitious to keep doing. Like you yeah. have to really want that prize. It almost has to be your project. To say, and I worked okay. with George Clooney on his directorial debut, which was in the film, Good Night and Good Luck. Hmm. And I remember him saying, not sure this was a great idea to wear both hats. <laughs> No, it's, it's not easy. I think he also did, uh, uh, it's not Dangerous Minds, the one with uh, uh, the, the, the gong show. Uh, oh, with Chuck, I'm I'm Chuck saying, Berry? Sam Rockwell, I'm a huge fan of, was yes. the star. What was that? Was that uh, I can't remember the name of it. So, so, something Dangerous Mind, and Clooney was a small part, but I think he directed that one as well. Yeah, and I've also uh, another great actor, you know, you know, turned director that I've had the pleasure of working with is Clint Eastwood. And uh, we did a movie called um, Blood Work. And once again, I played Clint's boss, which is kind of the absurdity of he's quite a bit older, but I played his boss in uh, in that film. And that was one of those pinch me, am I dreaming moments? Yes. I mean, you can imagine. And no matter how long I'd been making movies, and at that time, I think I was at about year 30. Seems like it was about 15 years ago. And, you know, they, they roll camera and Clint is directing. And I'm, and I'm the actor that's in the role, but I'm also still Glenn. <laughs> and I'm looking up. I mean, there's a camera to my left. But I'm looking up and I'm having a conversation with someone I've watched since I was four in Westerns and in all these great iconic films. And, and first of all, I'm having a conversation with him and he's looking right at me, which they never do on screen. They're always looking at someone else, but now Clint Eastwood is looking at me. And then there's the other thought of, and when I'm done with this heavenly adventure, someone's gonna i'm sorry what they're gonna give me a paycheck for it it's pretty cool and yeah and he has done that a lot i think even outlawed josie wells all those he directed acted yes. and that's one of my top 20 favorite movies and oh is so, outlaw josie wales i think so yeah oh, i gotta go there. back and see it i've seen it so many times but he also does the score at times for his movies so someone like Clint has probably had to take the complex and make it really simple. Like, I, I don't think he has a huge appetite to get into the details, extreme details of perfection, no, right? No, he doesn't. And in fact, I don't know if you've heard this about him. One is he loves to surprise the actor. Okay. And I'm going to show you what Clint Eastwood does when he calls okay. action. Because I had been warned and then I saw it for real. He goes just like this. Can you see behind my back? Yes. <laughs> he doesn't even say action. He is signaling from behind his back for his crew, which he has worked with for over 40 years and they know it's coming. So he's doing this. He starts going over the scene with me. We're going over the scene and we finish and he goes, that'll be my take. That's, oh, wow. that's what I'm going to use. 
And I said, oh, did you go back and look at it on the monitor? And he goes, no, we shot it. And I said, I had been warned about you. <laughs> and then he showed me, you know, what he does behind his back to just let him know roll camera because he just wants to have a conversation. He is known as to take Clint. And the reason is he feels that anything beyond a second take winds up hitting a point of diminishing returns. And you got to appreciate that as an actor, not oh. having to over labor. Yes. And you really appreciate it when you're the one shelling out the dollars for the movie because yes. time is money on a film set. So it means that he's moving through a lot of material rather expeditiously. And his feeling is that the early takes are the truest takes. And you can't point. fault him. He makes great movies. I think it was Fincher, uh, his recent movie, Mank, which I really enjoyed that. Uh, he talked about there's things you have to cut out to keep your budget. And for him, it is the CG, you know, it's the high tech things or bringing in helicopters. Uh, but yeah, you got to pick your spots. You got to figure out how to make that budget work which is a very real thing if you want to keep making movies, I would think. Absolutely. So yeah, there's got to be so many lessons you've learned along the way. I know you have shared some Michael Bay stories as far as how you showed up and how, again, philosophically coming in with the right attitude, bringing your best, going the extra mile, whatever it may be, has secured you not just multiple roles in Transformers, but Call of Duty and all these other things that have been very uh, fulfilling for you financially and otherwise. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that everything swirls around good energy mm -hmm. and that as long as we're running really good balanced, and here's a word I, I want to really send out. And it's such a simple word, but it's profoundly significant. And that's the word fair. Mm -hmm. Fair goes a long way with me. When you listen to someone and you go, you know what? That's fair. That, yeah. That's fair. That's fair that they're thinking that way. That's fair that they hold that expectation. That's a reasonable concern that it's fair. And so one of the character traits that I make it a point to really cling to is, is being fair. And I admire fair in other people. So the, the Michael Bay story, you know, that that's an example of, good energy going a long way because when Michael and I first met, it was on a movie called Pearl Harbor and I got to Corpus Christi uh, flown there from Los Angeles. We lived in LA at the time. We are back here in Dallas, Texas now, and we've been back for nine years and Dallas is where I hang my hat and I love it. Uh, Carolyn born and raised here as well. In fact, we live less than a mile from where we met which is really a beautiful, beautiful story. But when I went down to Corpus Christi to do uh, Pearl Harbor, and I may have shared this story with you before, but this is a, a new day and maybe I did, maybe I didn't, I don't know. But I saw on the call sheet that there was another actor there for the same role. And I remember looking at it going, excuse me, what? <laughs> and it's gotta be one of two things. It's either a typo or probably the biggest mistake I've ever seen in a film where they've already flown me down here. This didn't happen in my backyard of Los Angeles. I'm in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I'm scheduled to get aboard the USS Lexington and do a juicy role in a really big film directed by Michael Bay. It's a big deal. I've signed a big contract. Well, it turned out that it was a colossal mistake and that they had in fact, double cast the role. Hmm. And they called me the next day and said, uh, don't report to the lobby as the call sheet indicates the executive producer wants to have a conversation with you. That doesn't sound good. So when he called, he said, um, we've really, we feel like we've dropped the ball on this. I said, drop the ball. How so? And he said, well, shortly after Michael met you, he met another actor who is quite a bit older than you, like 15 years older and looks more like General Bull Halsey, Admiral, not General, Admiral Bull Halsey, than you do. And he's given him the role. I said, we have a contract. So you and I both know that I can go to the airport right now, and you still have to pay me for the movie, the entirety of the movie. He said, I'm aware of that, and that would be fair. So there's that word again. He said, that would be fair. We have a contract. You're right. 
I said, so here's the only thing I don't understand. I understand that poop happens, but um, why are you telling me this here instead of in Los Angeles? Why did you fly me here to give me this news? He said, because Glenn Michael wants you in the film. I said, doing what? He doesn't know. Okay. So now you can go to the lobby, be down there in a half an hour. We'll pick you up and carry you to set and we will figure it out when we get there and we will see what we will see. And I got there and Michael just made up things for me to do. And I never threw a hissy fit. I simply made the most out of it. And it was one of the most intelligent decisions next to marrying my wife mm. that I've made in my life is how to conduct myself. Cause I didn't like it. I'll be very candid and tell you, I did not like that situation, but I thought, okay, you don't like it, but you can either make it worse or make it better, which is kind of a great life teaching that no matter what we're feeling about something at any point, we can make things worse or better by our reaction to it. So, you know, it's, this is not an original concept, but it is truly in life, not what happens to us that determines our fate, but rather how we process what happens to us. And if we become masterful processors, you have then figured out life. And I don't say that lightly. Yeah. If there was ever wow. a, a real answer to what is the answer to life, the answer is to become a masterful processor of information as it shows up. When things, when things show up, are you processing in a beneficial way, or are you processing in a self-destructive way hmm. or a circumstantially destructive way? It might not even be you. It might not be self-destructive, -destruct but it can be bad for the whole group the way you're handling this. Is it good for the team? And then, of course, the ultimate spiritual response is, what would love do here? Hmm. What would love do? Because I know what ego would do. Ego would go get on the plane and fly back to LA and say, I can't believe that happened. Now send me a check. But of what worth is that behavior? Because I'm certainly going to end my relationship with Michael Bay. And Michael's the one that hired me for the film. So maybe I should just go discover what he wants to do. Smartest decision in my life because he wound up putting me in five more films and three rides around the world, one in Singapore, one in Los Angeles, and one in Orlando, where I signed a contract for 25 years for each ride. Wow. All tied to the proper handling of a moment, which I was not happy about. Were you, would, so that was philosophically driven. Was there a bit of a whisper there as well? I can't um, the answer is yes and yes. It was philosophically driven, and the whisper was like, just go. In There's no room for pride here. Just there's, the ship. there's such a lesson for, for just across the board, but in particular, anyone that's locked into a profession over a long period of time, the ripple effect and the seeds that get planted, you know, you and I both benefit from things we did 30 years ago, relationships we sold into here, here. And if they're a true relationship, I might not see, you know, Les Brown for five years or Dennis Waitley. And then all of a sudden you see them and you pick up where you left off and those benefits. Uh, now, again, as Jim Rohn would say, you can't quit and start over too many times because you keep losing the opportunity mm -hmm. to benefit from the seeds you sowed. But yeah, that's definitely amazing. So let me ask you this, playing off that. Do you, how do you deal with fear of loss? Because you said how we process information and, and take what's going on in the world. So you watch it all the time in your world. Maybe yeah. you're in a show and this is happening. That's happening. The cast is shifting, staying centered. I just suspect you're not a big fear of loss guy. You're how about zero. What, yeah. So, and, and I do mean that I'm not bragging. I'm admitting to you that fear of loss is not part of my life. And that's because you're locked into knowing you're just, you feel confident in if you just keep showing up in the right way, the right opportunities will keep coming. Is that yes? And the, the right way, meaning to show up in the way of being a healthy processor. 
that whatever comes my way, I'm going to process in a healthy, reasonable, and fair manner coming from love and believing that that formula is seamless in terms of its long-term projections. So I'm not saying that if we're all woo-woo-foo-foo and we light incense and we say our prayers and we sit in a lotus position that everything goes with ease. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we still encounter hardships no matter how illuminated our life is. However, our long-term projections are excellent based on how we handle life. It has been said, and I agree with it, and I'm not the one that said this, but I heard it many years ago, and I agree big time with this saying, Kyle, and that is that the largest portions, the largest portion of problems we, we have in life are directly linked to resistance to that which is. Mm. Wow. That that's the root cause of most of the problems we get into because there's what is, and then there's now what you going to do, mm. what you going to do. Cause that is nobody asked if you liked it or not. You, there's a good chance you don't like it, but that's not in question. What is in question is what are you going to do? And so if we resist that, which is, and you know, as well as I do being in the speaker industry for so long, we've seen people overcome the most adversarial circumstances. Well, they were, re they were dealing effectively with that, which is right. I mean, Spud Webb could not become six, three. That, which is, is that you're five, six, my friend. And he went, okay. And I'm going to show the NBA that five, six is six, three. Watch this. So his handling of his own stature was masterful. He said, I don't care watch me. And he went and did it. Jim Abbott, one hand pitcher for the California angels. Excuse me. What? You're a pitcher in the major leagues and they selected you and they knew you only had one hand and he would throw it, have the glove on the stub and right after each pitch, grab the glove, put it on his hand and be ready in case it was, the ball was hit back to the mound. And they said, and I'm convinced this was their thinking, although I never talked to the owners. Their thinking is not only do we want this guy, but more importantly, for the sake of the club, we want his consciousness on our team because that'll change everybody. Look at our one-handed pitcher doing his thing. It's beautiful. Kind of, kind of similar, but different when you, because you worked with Kiefer and you've watched Robert Downey Jr. Those are two people that dealt with some issues that sure. they were they were out of Hollywood for a while. And maybe no one thought either one would come back. And they both came back incredibly, which first of all says people are forgiving if you yes. show up in the right way. But I, again, I think they brought, uh, you know, people were pulling for them. And they probably had learned some lessons that helped them the next round. And the people that were pulling for them were those we talked about earlier that refused to see some questionable areas as labeling the person all bad. Right. And they thought there's a lot that's redeeming about this. Let's, let's give them another chance. And, you know, Kiefer's happened in the middle of the show. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with this timeline, but while we were shooting 24, he went to jail for 48 days. Wow. And I'm not outing him. This is a known fact. It happened at the time. It's, it's certainly available to be seen in the, online. And, um, and he came back a very humble and appreciative man because he realized that him being shut down and put in the Glendale City Jail also meant a whole lot of people out of work because you can't do 24 minus Kiefer. No. <laughs> so a whole lot of people got yeah. knocked out of a job because of a behavioral issue on his part, which brings this word up again. Fair? I don't think so. That's, that's not fair. It's not fair that you made that decision for a lot of other people because you were negligent and other people wound up being punished for your negligence. That's not fair. So it's time to reappreciate the position you're in, which is I'm the leader of this team and the team leans heavily upon me. 
So I need to make decisions that are not only rooted in my own desires, but that protect the lives of the team members that are on my team. Mm -hmm. Now it's not always about us. We can't just do what we want to do, especially if we're leaders. If we're leaders, we have to do what's best for the team. Right. Love that. Uh, And I'm thinking about disruptors. Like in your world, you've gotten to see a Quentin Tarantino where different people come in and I'm, I'm along this theme again of marching to your own drum, being true to yourself, not coming from a fear of loss, but saying, listen, I'm just going to do what I do. If people like it, awesome. And um, so talk about that. Have you gotten to work with people you feel are, have been disruptors that march to their own drum? And what's I, that like working with them? I have. And, and self-interest keeps me from naming them um, okay. because I just don't think that's, that's smart. Okay. But I've I've certainly worked with those. I've I've had the pleasure of working with Quentin Tarantino, but not as an actor, but just just sitting and having lunch with him, which one on one that was a weird story. I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, there there have been questionable personalities where, and, and I don't mean it as a negative necessarily. I'm no, I got it. Even like Scorsese came in, did things a little differently, um, and and they just felt. Now again, sometimes you got to trade doing one film to get the budget to do another film, but back to this essence of doing what you feel called to do. Yeah. Well, I had a situation. I won't even name the movie because that would make it too easy for people to track down who it is I'm referring to, but there was a, there was an actor and their behavior was simply put disgusting and unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And that was not only my perception, it was the across the board perception. And I realized Nobody's saying anything. And my dad raised me to speak up Hmm. when someone's out of line. And I thought, not yet. Not yet. Okay, now. And I went for him. And I went for him loudly. And I went for him in front of a lot of people. I don't mean I went for him physically. I mean, I hit him with a verbal two by four to the head and explained to him kind of the rules of life and how outrageous his behavior was. And that I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone to say, we're sick of it. Wow. And you're, and you're not going to send it in my direction. You're not going to not, I would prefer if no, you're not going to. And so the person was being a bully and they were a well-known star and they were being paid a lot of money. And, but that does not give you license to step on other human beings. So I let him know, not with me, Bubba, not with me. And especially since he had no place speaking up, nobody was talking to him. The director had given me um, a piece of business to do. And then he ran his mouth and questioned it in front of everybody and said, guys, when we're making a movie that's about this, then we'll call that movie this, whatever this was that he was giving me to do. And that's when I turned and uh, explained to him that no one was talking with him and that actually I was carrying out the directions of the director, his orders. And last time I checked, this is the director, not you. So I won't be paying any attention to you. And as far as I'm concerned, you can keep your mouth shut. And it was it was so quiet. You could have heard a mouse peeing on cotton. You were playing the role you often play. I mean, that was you being the general and being the, the guy. Yeah. Uh, it, did you see a positive ripple come from that? Either hugely, hugely wow. but, but not from him because he had too much pride. But what was great is it was, it, there was a deafening silence. And then the director said, you know what? Let's break for lunch. And, and, <laughs> Cause it was so tense and we broke for lunch. This was many years ago. And uh, the director came up to me and he said, do you have any idea how many people you were speaking on behalf of? I said, let me guess everyone here. He said, yes. And it was, it was a lot. It was a huge amount of people. And he shook my hand. And then one of the other stars came up and said, I heard what happened wasn't there, but heard it and came up and shook my hand and said, thank you, because here's the problem. If I say something or if the director says something, 
this person could walk and it would shut production down. So the right person spoke up, you. And it was in the moment too. It was, they, he, like you said, you'd been sitting on it. And then when that right moment. For six weeks, I'd been sitting on it. And so that, that's another lesson as well is, uh, you know, wait for the inspiration, have, you know, have, have you thought about it? It was contemplation and then you, and uh, it could have worked against you, but it sounded like it was just a, a word in season. It was the right thing. I'll tell you why it didn't right work time. against me. The reason it didn't work against me is nothing I said was hot headed and untrue. Mm. Everything I said in the moment was the truth. And all the witnesses went about damn time, <laughs> about damn time. Somebody told this fellow the truth. And, and that's all it was. It was just someone saying, you're not going to do that with me. There were no threats. I didn't call him names. There were no expletives. I just said, not on my watch. Wow. And that was, that was the end of it. And it never happened again. And it did change his behavior. Love that. Because wow. he'd been called on his So stuff. powerful. So powerful. I'm going to have to find out later who this was. Uh, I'll tell you privately. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Glenn, are there roles you won't take? Have there been roles you don't take? Yeah, there, there is, um, there's only one role I didn't take and it was years ago and it was a a role that would have paid me a lot of money. So truly my principles are not for sale, which is something I learned about me in that moment. And that, that felt good, frankly, uh, that my principles are not for sale because they wanted me to play a heavy smoker. Mm. And I watched my grandmother die from smoking. I watched my dad die of smoking and my brother was a smoker and an alcoholic and he died. 59 for my grandmother, 66 for my dad, 62 for my brother. Enough evidence, Your Honor. I get it. Yes. And so because my face is known, even if my name isn't, my face is very well known in the film and TV industry. First of all, I don't want to do it. But the other reason I don't do it, so there's more than just my own desires. I don't want any young impressionable kid who looks up to Aaron Pierce from 24 that sees Aaron Pierce smoking a cigarette to decide, well, it's fine. I mean, Aaron smokes and, and we do have an effect on people. So I just don't ever want to be seen with a cigarette in my mouth. I'm very anti-smoking and um, I'm not anti anyone that does smoke. I have a few friends that are smokers, but I, I think it's one of the worst things to have ever been created in the world that has ended a lot of lives prematurely. And, um, and so I turned to roll down because I didn't want, want to be an on-camera smoker. Wow. Okay. Love that. That's, uh, that's powerful. So Glenn, you know, the fan always comes out in me and I, I love movies. Uh, my son loves movies. And I think of like a Quentin Tarantino, uh, Steven Spielberg. Do you have some experiences or some stories you could share with us? Because I love the behind the scenes type of stories our guests can bring to the listeners. I do. I actually have stories with both of those gentlemen. 